Ever wonder where all this ham radio tech came from? I mean, we're sitting here flipping to USB or LSB without thinking about it. It's just the default, right? But here's something wild. Single side band, or SSB, almost never happened. For decades, it was just an idea looking for a home. And when it finally showed up, let's just say, not everyone rolled out the welcome mat. So here's the story. It took me a while to piece it together. But once I did, well, I couldn't believe we never talked about this more. Back in the early 1900s, 1915 to be exact, this AT&T engineer named John Renshaw Carson came up with a theory. He proved you didn't actually need all that stuff in a normal AM transmission. The carrier? Redundant? One of the sidebands? Useless. All the voice info lived in just one sideband. And just like that, single sideband was born, on paper anyway. But making it work? That was the hard part. Let me put it this way. Carson's theory was brilliant, but it was way ahead of its time. Back then, radio transmitters were big, hot, finicky beasts made with vacuum tubes and chunky transformers. Filters were crude. Oscillators drifted like a rowboat in a hurricane. Trying to build a sideband rig in 1915, you'd have had better luck launching a satellite with a slingshot. So, yeah, Carson's idea kind of sat there for years, collecting dust in tech journals while everyone kept blasting full-power AM across the spectrum like it was the golden age of radio, which, to be fair, it was. Now, fast forward to the 1920s. Bell Labs and AT&T started tinkering with Carson's idea again, and in 1927, they pulled it off. They set up a working transatlantic SSB circuit, New York to London. It was a big deal. That one move saved a ton of bandwidth on undersea cables and opened the door for more long-distance voice calls. But for us, hams, it was still out of reach. The gear was massive. Think refrigerator-sized racks packed with crystal filters, precision modulators, and regulators that needed constant babying. Not exactly something you could pick up at the local Radio Shack. Then World War II happened. And that, ironically, is when SSB got its biggest boost. Military engineers needed ways to pack more voice traffic into tight frequency bands. They also needed secure, long-range communication that wouldn't blow their position to enemy interceptors. Single sideband checked both boxes. So, the war effort poured money and brainpower into making it work. They solved problems. They miniaturized components. They developed mechanical filters that could carve out just the right slice of spectrum. Most importantly, they proved SSB worked under the worst conditions imaginable. When the war ended, the military dumped a, a lot of surplus gear back into the civilian market. And hams? We don't let a good piece of gear go to waste. Some of those returning radio operators and engineers brought home not just their uniforms, but their curiosity. Guys who'd worked on SSB and bombers and field stations started wondering, could I build one of these in my garage? So in the late 40s, 1947 or so, a few hams started to mess around with it, mostly guys with military or engineering backgrounds. These weren't weekend tinkerers. They were real RF nerds. I read that one of the earliest amateur sideband QSOs sometime around 47. But let me tell you, it did not sound great. Not back then. Early SSB gear was twitchy, receivers drifted, suppression was poor, and if you tried to listen to sideband on a regular AM rig, it sounded like a duck on helium, not even joking. Still, those early adopters kept going. Guys like Arthur Collins, you've probably heard of Collins Radio, and Wes Shum, who founded Central Electronics. These weren't just radio guys, these were visionaries. They didn't just want to build better radios. They wanted to change how ham radio worked, make it more efficient, effective, and modern. And finally, in 1957, Collins dropped the KWM-1, a sleek little transceiver, one box, SSB-ready, no more janky phasing rigs or crystal filter klugas 
plug it in, tune it up, and go. And boy, this was a game changer. The audio was clear, stable. You didn't need a physics degree to operate it. And that's when things started to click. That same year, Strategic Air Command officially adopted SSB for its aircraft comms. When the guys flying B-52s over the Arctic are using something, you better believe it's the real deal. From there, it snowballed. By the early 1960s, SSB was everywhere. Contesters loved it. DXers wouldn't shut up about it. New transceivers, Collins, Drake, Swan, Heathkit, you name it. They were all in. And today, it's second nature. USB on 20, LSB on 40, and 75. Flip the switch and go. But here's the part I bet you didn't know. And it kind of blew my mind when I found out. There was a war over this. Like a full-on frequency jamming, letter to QST writing, club splitting, on-air shouting kind of war between AM hams and the slop bucketeers. Yeah, they called SSB slop bucket. Said it sounded terrible. Said it was cheating. Said it wasn't real ham radio. I came across this story about the 1956 ARRL National Convention. Art Collins is giving a talk about SSB, right? Big moment. And AM guys stand up and walk out of the room. Just leave. Another story had AM operators tuning up right on top of sideband QSOs just to make a point. Or worse, sabotaging sideband demos at ham fests. One guy even misaligned the oscillator on a demo rig the night before, just to make it sound awful. Entire organizations were formed to defend AM. AM International. The AM Preservation Society. They had newsletters, operating events, and get this, they tried to lobby the FCC for AM-only frequencies. It wasn't about just how it sounded. It was about pride, identity. A lot of these guys had built their AM rigs from scratch. This new single-side band stuff, it felt elitist, expensive, overcomplicated, too clinical. And man, it hit me. That same tension, it's still around. You ever hang out in an online ham forum? Say something nice about FT8 and watch the pitchforks come out. Not real radio? Lazy. Where's the skill? Sound familiar? Same with DMR. If it needs the internet, it's not ham radio. And POTA? Ten-second contacts in a park? That's not operating, that's playing. Same story, different tech. SSB didn't ruin ham radio. It made it better. And guess what? FT8, DMR, and parks on the air... They're not going to ruin it either. They're going to keep it alive. So yeah, next time someone grumbles about digital modes or guys running five watts from a tent on a mountaintop, just smile. Because 60 years ago, someone probably grumbled about you for using sideband. Now, hey, whatever you do, don't share this story. Definitely do not like it. And for the love of all that's sacred, don't subscribe. Because if you do, you might just enjoy learning stuff. And we can't have that now, can we? And if you hear or see me, call sign N2LEE, -E, operating FT8, RTTY, or sideband, I mean slop bucket, between 80 and 6 meters, be sure and give me a call. Whoops, one last thing. And seriously, this is the most important. I cannot express how grateful I am that so many of you are watching and commenting. I get a huge smile on my face when you subscribe. I get a kick that you do it anyway. So